Hello and greetings to my wonderful friends out there. Welcome to Vibrant. Wow, what a busy day. I mean, not like busy, but there's just like an amazing amount of people streaming tonight. <laughs> Odin's Alchemy still going over there with Benjamin Balderson. Uh, Kaylee burkana has got her show tonight after Vibrant. Oh, man, lots of good choices. We are blessed with an amazing community. I am so excited to be here with my good friends from Family Fungi. Dot net <laughs> james and elise they're wonderful and they've even got their uh, little buddy here as well so family fungi if you guys are sleeping on that it's a really great resource for excellent plant-based medicines mycelium based medicines um mycelicins <laughs> i don't know i've got this remedy bottle right here of their uh, reishi blend it's got reishi lion's mane chaga shiitake turkey tail it's really good stuff. Uh, my lovely significant other got a little bit of a sniffle detox not long ago, and this was a major component to knocking it out faster and stronger. So very grateful to you guys, family fun guy friends. How are y'all doing tonight? Welcome to uh, Vibrant once again. Looks like you're Cheers, big. brother. Cheers. We're doing well. Can you hear us pretty good? Oh, yeah, yeah. I like that. Uh, <laughs> We got baby present. This is perfect for this particular conversation topic. A blessed, blessed family you guys are just glowing over there. And yeah, you were also, at least you were just on with our other great friend, Michelle, on her healing home. That looked really good. I've heard great things. I hadn't got a chance to check it out yet, but people ought to do that too. Yeah, it was a lot of fun speaking with her. It felt like uh, old friend just having a conversation. Seriously, just hanging out and talking with one another, and it was beautiful. Absolutely awesome. So while we wait for a few people to pile in, and I got to just say thanks to everyone who's here among all the really good options out there for <laughs> shows tonight. Uh, just welcome to all of you, but I wanted to highlight this comment here from Carrie, who says, at least helped me with my confidence in delivering my baby at home. I was advised not to, but I did anyways, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, I bet you love to hear stuff like that. And I bet you hear that all the time, especially as you're going on more shows. So that's really awesome. Welcome, Carrie and everybody else. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I want to remind everybody about the fun stuff over at the Interverse merch store, because I want you to sleep on this. this all my, you know, fun art creations that I've been making over the years. Uh, you got backpacks. <laughs> Well, let's just look at this up close. Wow. It is crispier than that in person when you get it. <laughs> the uh, the resolution of like the preview artwork isn't as, isn't as high res as it's going to look when you really get it. So there's a lot of awesome choices. But the one I just uploaded tonight before we came on is this puzzle right here. And it looks like a doozy. I mean, it's got like a consistent color scheme to it. So I bet this would be a fun challenge. Check it out, interversemerch.com. I'll drop the link. Oh, I already did. Great. So, yeah, <laughs> there's clothing, there's backpacks, there's get a phone case like I've got right here for myself. Lots of fun stuff. I hope you guys go stop by and, um, you know, adorn yourselves with some of my creations or at the very least to rep the logo of your favorite podcast. I appreciate it. And then the last thing I'm going to ask for you guys to do is go share the stream, if you don't mind, with your friends or with a Telegram group or some place that you think would be well received. And with that, we are ready to get into it. I think Gabriel will be back any second as well. Uh, if you can hear me right now, Gabriel, <laughs> your device is not connected to the uh, stream. So just reconnect, hop back in. We'll see you in a bit. But James, Elise, how have you guys been? How's the uh, how's the winter? time you know winter solstice time treating y'all yeah it's been great we uh we just harvested a bunch of our chickens so we had broiler chickens and um our small homestead is very productive so we harvested chickens on sunday today we harvested a bunch of cabbage and prepared our plants because it is about to freeze it's going to get in the 20s here which we're in uh south louisiana so it's not very common to get the 20s for an extended period of time. It's going to be like four or five days. And so we're having to kind of hustle to get things 
battened down and uh, ready for that. Um, but yeah, we're we're uh, starting to feel super reflective. I think that that comes with this time of year is that you get reflective and you start to try to give yourself a springboard for going into the new year. You try to give yourself some momentum and build on your uh, your lessons and your successes of uh, this this turn of the cycle. Um, you know, history doesn't repeat it rhymes. So we're going to have some rhyming going on next year. And it's better to, uh, to brush yourself up on your vocabulary. That way you can uh, make the most of these magical words, which is predominantly what we came here to talk about tonight is law and birth and all of the things regarding people's limitations on their perspective of what birth is. Uh, uh, we kind of got handed this culture recently that is very institutionalized. The whole thing is a is a madhouse, <laughs> and so uh, a lot of a lot of us don't realize that we've been institutionalized from birth, and we were certified as uh, a productive capacitor for this energy system that is the maritime admiralty commercial system that we get indoctrinated into without really necessarily willing, but more it's it's more like you get tempted. Uh, I don't want to say coerced because it is really more like temptation. And then also we're, we're made ignorant through the uh, lack of education that brings you into a fuller uh, comprehension of what it is that we're actually doing here. Like we're spiritual beings on this physical plane. But there are implications to having to exist with one another. And that comes up with contract law and that comes up with trade and goods, um, all, all sorts of different mechanisms of, uh, of how we have to be here. Um, there are real world tangible issues. And one thing that we've seen through homesteading over the past few years is how well taken care of we are. Like if you can flick on a light switch, you're very, very well taken care of. You don't have to earn that electricity somehow. And that's not just through uh, through going and getting an hourly wage. I mean, you don't have to like figure out the mechanics of how electricity is made, and you're uh, you're very well taken care of. And we're we're part of that, and we're we're finding ourselves. All, I think collectively, we're finding ourselves in a pinch. Like especially over the past two years, there became like a a real slipping of the mask. Like, hey, what's behind the mask of civility is kind of. Uh, it is bearing teeth. Oh man, there's a lot to unpack with all this. You know, I was just talking to my pregnant sister today about, you know, singing your praises and talking about the possibility of life outside the system for future generations and not registering with the king <laughs> just to exist, right? And uh, this is no like no dig at her or anything, but her reaction was similar to what a lot of people's reaction would be, which is, oh, that's going to make life really hard for their kids. Right. And I wonder maybe if that's a good place to start or maybe we should back that up completely and talk about <laughs> like what it is that you guys are doing with your children and, um, you know, what what's up uh, maybe from the ground up. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll talk about it more from like foundational principles, because I think that people can start to hyper focus on details and they're doing it from an area that they're most familiar with. They're most familiar with the knowledge that um, you can you can get a credit card, you can use money. But a lot of people don't understand that the money that we are most um, tempted to use Federal Reserve notes and, and the like, fiat currency. Um, we we tend to we're using someone else's property. This is where this is really where it comes down to with your children, and uh, biblically or um, just in the, in the the truest sense of things, like your children are considered your issues. They're issued forth from. You. And this is this is actually defined in uh, in Black's Law is that that your children are your progeny or your issues and you issue them for it. You can also issue other things for it. They're your creations. Your issues are your creations. 
So if you've got to deal with your issues, you actually have to make amends with your creations. You have to bring some balance to the things that you've brought into reality here. Um, and one of the things that we have done as a society is say, well, we're going to play the commercial game. And to do that, there has to be some sort of uh, good faith whenever you're using someone else's property. If you don't have, if you don't have gold or silver, which is tangible property, and you're going to be using someone's intangible property or the tangible paper stuff, but it's really, it's really a fictitious thing in the mind. If you're going to use someone else's property, then you have to pay the man. It's just that simple. If you're going to use someone else's property, pay the man. Well, a lot of us. So that's just like right in with the word sorcery of what they've named, you know, the one issuing the offspring, (laughs) the pair that rent. (laughs) Yeah. Are you renting your own uh, issue? Yeah. And so this is what it, what has become is that you gave up your children so that you could get benefits. So that comes in the form of a tax benefit comes in the form of a tax write off. Um, It's, and, and this is a real touchy subject for people because we've had conversations with people where uh, our, our friends that are like, Hey, I think that, what you guys are doing is kind of out there is is because neither of our our children have a social or a birth certificate other than the documents that we've created for them we didn't go beg for other for the use of other people's property we created our own property and so because of that it has value why because they would use the papers if we use their papers they would use it as a security they would securitize it so that they could make, so they could monetize it. So they could say, this person has a physical existence, will bear X amount of value in labor. And so we're gonna go ahead and write in that they're here. And so that comes in the form of acts and laws and all this stuff that artificially create money. They're doing it through the issuance of these papers. It's as simple as an application for a bank account, an application for a social security number. Any application is actually money. It is transferable and can be used to uh it can be securitized and used to monetize and so i do this is something that i'm not very well versed on which is the internet of things but it's the attempt uh, broadly the attempt to um digitize through serial coding or uh, blockchain technology pretty much every physical thing so that it can be uh, so, so that it can have, it can be evaluated. It can have an electronic valuation, a non-physical valuation. So this is like spitting in the face of the creator, which is saying, well, I, I overlaid this matrix over the creation and that's my creation. The little I. Let me add in there too. You're talking about application for you know, social security application for federal citizenship, et cetera. Well, application has multiple meanings. <laughs> we think of the word application. We think like a piece of paperwork where we're asking for something, but application is the act of laying something on. So when you are getting the application for social security, you are laying on this fictional person layering on, on top of the living being (laughs) and another interesting definition of application is the act of fixing the mind i mean think of that you know as in the idea of application of your mind to study or application of your mind to this or that so uh there's a lot of really interesting definitions of the word application when you go to webster's 1828 another one is in theology the act by which the merits of Christ are transferred to man for his justification. So when you are, (laughs) when you're making the state, your savior, whenever they're salvaging your, you know, derelict ship, if you will, and giving you this citizenship, they are taking on the role of uh, Christ or God to you, the creator that controls its creation. And that creation is the thing laid on the artificial person. And so, The place that we get with people whenever we start having this conversation, they'll ask, well, what should I do? And the only thing that I can tell anyone is that 
the power is within your hands to learn this knowledge. It's It's been made publicly available and it's kind of a slap in the face because instead of that being as accessible as other media, media sources, what has been made accessible is things that are uh, inconsequential. They, they have no weight or bearing. They're, uh, they, they have no substance. And so um, it, we can find the, the substance in these definitions, like you're talking about the definition of application. And whenever we start to see the dichotomy of the English language between our lay definitions of things versus a legalese or legalistic definition of things, then we'll, we'll start to see the ways in which we've, we've kind of been um, led by the nose, but through desire. Like you got, you got the whiff of something nice, and then it, it got the, the space of that desire got filled with something else. Instead of the desire for fulfillment that comes through the greatest, highest connection of faith to your creator, it got filled with, with just something that tastes sweet. It's, it's sweet as sugar, as addictive as sugar. You'll like people still want benefits and privileges. The fact of the matter is, if you ever did an application for a public utility, you begged, you begged, you begged for help. You, you instead of the alternative, which was to to be with your creator and his source of energy, his fire. Like as that's as simple as I I found it so far. And dude, it's that's intense. Yeah, buddy. Hey guys, Hello. we have a surprise special Hello. guest joining us on the panel. Welcome, Beth Martins. It's so good to see you. One year ago today. One year Whoa. ago today, we had Beth on for a talk, and it just felt it. She just popped into my mind when we were setting up this show, and I was like, you know what? She would be perfect for this conversation. Well versed in law, she's a mom, and so Beth, you're just now joining us, but we're kind of starting to dig into the nitty gritty talking about, you know, whether or not to put in your application for baby to receive his various forms of benefits <laughs> and services with the, uh, the government and just that word application sent us off on a whole tangent because it's not as simple of a word as people would imagine, <laughs> but yeah. How are you doing? Welcome. What's uh, what's good. I'm very good. Uh, yeah. Everything's good. I'm making my own trouble as usual. Thanks for having me. I totally appreciate it. Nice to see you, Slick Dissident and uh, Family Fungi. <laughs> yeah, Beth, this is James and Elise from Family Fungi. They've hey. also got baby with them. Oh, <laughs> how nice. So that yeah. makes it extra it's real. How old is your little one? Uh, we have two. Our oldest is three mm. and our youngest is eight months. Eight months. Oh my gosh, you guys. Congratulations on your young family. Thank you very much. Hmm. How sweet. Mm. That, that's an amazing memory that was a, a, a year ago. I remember that day because I was listening to you guys. You and Chance were having a show, and I was so excited because I really wanted to be a part of the conversation. <laughs> and I, so I still remember that that show. That was great. Oh, Good there memory. You go. Yeah, I was blurry. I was actually, I think I was bragging that I didn't get sick in the last three years, but I was getting sick that night. So it instantly brought back my uh, humble humbleness. <laughs> nice. That's yeah. sweet. And so just to kind of stitch that up whenever we were talking about the application. So it it's as I have come to uh, comprehend and understand this is that at any point, anybody can apply to be a citizen and it, you can even not have papers and, and, and they'll create the, pay, the documents for you. So there are people that have come from uh, the, a Mennonite or Amish community and they've had no uh, foundational documents of identity, but we've done that for our family, which is you, you can either keep it. It's it was traditionally done through a family Bible. You can do it through whatever record keeping you want. But we have to find the power within ourselves to stop looking for someone else to be the record keeper for to stop to, to not be looking for benefits and privileges because it's a benefit or a privilege to have someone do a service for you and a service is as much as, hey, can you draw up this paperwork for me that says that my uh, my son was, you know, birthed on this day, emerged into being. So we made a document that was titled Emergence into Being. But we're all creators, so you can title the document whatever you damn well please, but most people are, they're, they're hung up on the blank page. They, they have no idea how to structure their, their mind 
and then put it in black and white and, and read it back. Because then you have to see the power of your own hand and the power of your own mind. And it's a damn, it's a, it's a responsibility that a lot of people are deferring away from themselves. They're deferring authority. And a lot of us have not realized the way in which power and authority emanate into our realm is from the creator to man, man to government, and government to corporations. These are... Uh, Anything that we try to subjugate ourselves to that is our creation is us engaging in Satanism, is us putting something before the creator, which is the only thing between us there. And so there's no space. It's we we and the creator are in constant communion unless we put the state or unless we put a corporation between our relationship. Yeah, man. You know, uh, something that rhymes very powerfully and for a good reason, is that aspect of pleading. Um, and when the English language was introduced into the high courts, it was labeled as, the English language was labeled the language of the pleading. And so it was uh, accepted in the culture of jurisdiction of, you know, uh, way back then, under the presupposition that we were in the position of complaining or in a victim stance even for that matter. And that's just something to think about and to keep in mind uh, as the nature of the way that the language we have was uh, perceived in the beginning. And that's, uh, it's just an important piece of history uh, because you know uh, we gain mastery of it and we're not, we're not asking anymore, we're telling. <laughs> Yeah, the law functions on assumptions and presumptions. And so whenever you're engaged in any sort of court, you're engaged in battle. And a lot of people don't see it as war, but it's 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 war with paper. And the, the war is not settled by going into the court to argue. It's settled before you even go to court. It's settled through the post. It's settled through uh, notaries. Notaries make the record. And this is one of the most powerful tools that any individual can learn is how to draw up a document, and have it notarized and then submit it for the record. It's a, it takes your time to do it. And that's why people pay attorneys. But the attorney, their first obligation is to the court. They're, they're, they have no obligation to their uh, to, to their client in, in as much as their client is dutifully performing. And if you uh, chance, if you'll look up the definition of performance, it's kind of like what we're what we're going on about application is there the different tenses of how you're using it and the different meanings can can broadly impact our usage of those words in our in our day to day. But if you have no obligation to perform, so no song and dance for these people in their court system, then they can they have no power over you. But this is. This is the catch, and this is the biggest test of faith. Is people are like, well, they'll just kill you. It's like, you're right, you're right. Lead has always been the currency of this realm. Force, uh, might makes right. If someone can beat you and make you do it, you'll either do it or you'll or you'll die. And that's the the highest test of faith. Is that would you go back to your creator? Would you allow this moment to end so that? You could stand for your principles and the utmost truth. And a lot of people have not followed that line of reasoning all the way out. And that's a very large test of faith. Well, you know, another thing to add to that, too, is that I believe personally, I believe that a lot of what we see happen in the cooties era, like you can't cross a border without a cowpoke. You can't do this. You can't do that. When in reality, if you just knew your rights and you held a, energy that <laughs> was loving and you knew your jurisdiction with your creator and all that, that stuff really didn't apply. And I think the same goes for like all of the, the currency of lead, that it's a very fictional currency as well in the sense that they, the they's out there <laughs> need to continually fill our awareness with murder, theft, rape, death, misery to create that belief that, Around every corner is a boogeyman, and I'm about to be a victim. 
when in truth, I do not think that that's how life works. I think that uh, I don't I don't even personally think that you can just get randomly murdered for no reason without a strong belief or a strong like uh, consequence of your own behavior that immediately brings that about in a sort of reflective way. You know, so at the point where you're standing, if standing before the creator out of your body and, you know, you lost your life in some way, shape or form, you would only ever have got there in a way that was good, true and beautiful. I don't think that there are there's no such thing as, in my opinion, accidents. <laughs> so that's a big part of like breaking the spell too of the fear of like, well, what will go wrong if I don't follow the rules is that if you know you're doing no wrong and you're doing no harm, there is like a protection in that. There's an armor in that. And the rejection of all the offers constitutes keeping your own, holding your own energetic integrity. And man, Owen, Owen said the greatest thing a day or two ago that just completely blew my mind. I was like, that is the most succinct way I've ever heard it. He said, he said, the full armor of God is keeping your energy in your own battery. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's that's the capital T truth right there. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting topic. And I have, uh, if I can jump in here, I've been around the bend, I have to say. And in a way, not come full circle because I really didn't know absolutely anything or I didn't know anything about the law before this, all of this stuff started to happen. And um, so I, I hear I hear the logic in all of it. I even agree with it. Hello, Alpha Warrior. Nice to see you. I'm glad you're here. Um, Mike, I think, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I would have agreed more, but honestly, I've come back to a, a different place. I don't know why I think I'm coming back, but I'm here now, <laughs> right where we are. And so, you know, I think there's a whole lot of psyop in there. I'll just jump right right to the chase because yes it makes sense yes there's you know there's logic and reason and and it's way better than just you know exposing your belly to the beast and having him eviscerate you that's it's just way better because there's a level of empowerment there but you know if i was to have a baby now i would register them just the same which might to some people sound insanity given what we know but it's the same thing. I've moved into the private. My whole world has become private domain almost entirely, although some exceptions lie there. It doesn't stop me from operating in the public. I think we need mastery in both realms. And if you don't have the skills, then you can't be a master in that realm. So, you know, I don't want to kill the public domain. I don't want to kill the courts. I don't want to kill the government. It just needs to be in a much more natural balance. It's very unnaturally out of balance where we're at right now. The public is every day, the public is eating more of the private. Uh, one of the examples I use often these days is about, um, you know, just went to do my online banking and the bank stops me and says, you cannot continue to use online banking unless you answer these questions. And it was personal questions about my employment so I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I'll just you know say I have a ministry, and uh, but they don't they don't have an option for a ministry. They don't have even an option for self-employed. So I'm looking at all these options, and there was unemployed, and I thought to myself, well, I'm pretty unemployed. I'm unemployable. <laughs> no one would hire me. I've been fired from my one and a half jobs in my life, and so I put unemployed, and they make you like before you click, are you swearing that this is the truth? And it's like, yeah, this is the truth, and it le it was the best option, but. You know, so just as an example to see that they they are going to break and enter until we stop them and refuse to hand over our private life, which the family absolutely is, the family and the household, and then any, you know, symbolic household you create with your people under private contract, then, you know, that's, that's we, we have that opportunity, we just don't know we have that opportunity and much of life can be lived without any big announcement to the government at all. They don't even need to know what I'm doing. I don't need to report them. It's under private contract. We're never, ever going to turn to the public system to, um, you know, moderate a dispute for us or, or anything like that. I have my own system of tribunals. If we have internal conflict, we are going to deal with it. They sign their right to, um, to sue me or anyone in the, in the ministry. 
by that agreement. And uh, there was a really good case that went um, around a few weeks ago in Canada. There was a sex club. There was a private club and it was by membership and uh, police raided them and they tried to bring charges on them for what they were doing. Well, the judge ruled, no, actually, these are private contracts. I have no jurisdiction here and you guys go carry on. Right. So if if I totally. Yeah, I just want to jump in here for a sec. I totally agree that you have to learn the principles of both public and private. You have to delineate in your mind whenever you're in which realm, like whenever you're dealing with family law, family law is private law. Uh, But whenever you're dealing with administrative law, and this is where a a lot of people tend to blend, is they tend to blend their family law in with the administrative. That's where that's where I've I've come to, to is that I think that registering them is not allowing them full disclosure before they're before they're able to to be of age and for them to be fully aware of the consequences of them being a part of the commercial system prior to just putting them in it it is is where i found conflict personally like spiritually i couldn't do it i i've had both of my children at home and it was totally through faith it wasn't through oh if they're we're going to go to the hospital if there's an emergency. Of course, of course. But we're not thinking about that. What we're thinking about is that there is a baby arriving. This is as present as I can be with this moment. And I can't think about all of the if then what if scenarios with regards to registering children. It seems as though it is doesn't allow them to be fully mature because then they can start taking part in credit without even understanding what credit is. If you get a credit card at 18 and you didn't know that you were being, uh, that you, you were able to get it because you were already indoctrinated into this way of being, that's, that's where, that's where my conflict with the whole system is, is not that it's there. I find that there is, obvious utility in being able to transmit labor energy from one individual to another. You did work over here and it was value and it has a value and and you're able to transfer that energy. I I see that, but I don't see the the utility in putting your children into it without them knowing that they made that choice, but rather that you made the choice for them. And then it feels like you're already in the momentum, like you're kind of being pulled along already. And, and that's, that's what I, I was homeschooled. And so I, I, I craved information. And so as I started to learn the, the definitions of these words through their texts, that's how I came to this. It, and I, I understand that there are cases that judges look at favorably that you have a private contract. And that's where another principle comes in, which is, Contract makes the law. If there's no contract, there's no agreement. If there's no agreement, there's no meeting of minds. If there's no meeting of mind, there's no joinder. Yeah, and I will add in too, though, that it is, uh, I think, a fair decision either way for the parent to, but in particular that you really want to, I would prefer that somebody knew the full ramifications of both choices before they made a choice and And i just want to say that to not maybe cause any hard feelings of people out there who had children before they knew a thing about uh, even a single thing about law and just sort of went along with the system you know nescience or not knowing is not the same thing as ignoring and ignorance and many parents were in that position and so you know but i i see the (laughs) value in both ways of going about it but uh, like where I'm at, I think I would probably go the route James is going, but I have a fraction of the knowledge of probably anybody on this panel when it comes down to it. And this is where I would stress for you to start reading about trust law. Trust law has some of the greatest gravy that you can find about um, how to set up your estate for your family. Mm-hmm. And that way, that, that way it has a continuance 
outside of anyone's physical existence. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, definition that just crossed my radar uh, recently, it's on my mind right now, is uh, substantive rights. Uh, you know, the fact that your kids are not on the books, they now have access to substantive rights, which uh, the definition I read recently is like uh, self-providing or self-sustaining which is uh, exemplified in the fact that, like you said, you might have to write up the paperwork yourself. You know, you have to be the resource of the paperwork, you know, so that you're entitled. Uh, that is to say that you are in the title of the paperwork that you're making, uh, gi giving you the equity. And, and this is, go ahead, Beth. Uh, I just really like what Robin said in the chat that a piece of paper does not make you a slave. Ignorance makes you a slave. And, uh, you know, so That's it. To, to give it any power that it has power over you, no, it is your ignorance that is powering over you and just learning to navigate the the situation. I was just going to say about the sex club, somebody uh Mike responded to that. And uh, so the, the point of saying that was that if they can do something that, you know, some people might consider immoral, though it's not necessarily the case. If people aren't getting hurt, it's all consensual. But if they can do that and, and it's defensible in the courts, then we can do good things <laughs> to help people and serve, right? Then that's even way more defensible. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I just, I totally don't buy it anymore that registering your child with the government is giving your child. I don't, I don't buy it that registering your car is giving it to the state or, or that you're making any uh, allegiance. Also, you know, because you are the govern, you are the um, responsible for them until they can make their own decisions. When is that? Is that 18 years old? Is that 20 years old? Is that 30 years old? You don't know when are they going to be responsible enough to make their own decisions and actually understand this stuff, right? I didn't understand it until I'm in my 50s. I didn't even have a hot clue. So, you know, when is that going to happen? And, and for any parents out there that, you know, maybe have gone the path, and I, I wish you all the best, James, like 100%, absolutely no um, ill wish there. But I, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't buy into that, that you gave your, your child over. It comes down to how do you navigate your life? Do you, do you turn to the government for things that you should be accessing within, in, within your own private world? Because that, you know, that that's how it happens. You get scared. You're like, oh, I, I can't handle this. I can't do this. I'm going to go and get their advice. And once you're in their realm, you know, there was a, for example, a, a mom got scared with a, a fever that her baby was having recently, <clears throat> the uh, sister of Tasha Fishman, who I've had on a couple of times. And uh, so they threw the book at her. And next thing you know, they um, signed her up for surgery that she did not consent to. There was a big war. And they found the dad who hadn't been in the picture for a long time and allowed him to consent to the surgery. And, and then she had this, what, spinal tap, I think it's called, uh, like a hideous thing for a young baby to, to go through. And it's happened to me too, where, you know, I, I don't access my own inner resource or community resources and I put myself in their hands and, and it's, it's kind of how it goes. Uh, I'm sure you heard about this, but there was a recent <laughs> hubbub about somebody in Canada, a veteran who needed some sort of like handicap assistance installed into the apartment complex they lived in. And they've been waiting for many years for someone in the government to perform this act of altruism for their benefit. And uh, they called about it and received the reply. Well, you know, we cannot, we can't do that right now. We can't install the handicap assistance, but would you like help committing suicide? And so yeah. that's basically, you know, that basically boils it down in a nutshell. As soon as you start turning to that uh, system for uh, benefits, there's like a slippery slope that leads towards uh, a sort of suicide. So, you know, I, I get it both ways that like at the end of the day, when you're playing in the world of fiction, it always is and always will remain fiction. So there is no actual uh, you know, ownership or transfer of property or anything when this, that, or the other tangible uh, issue of your own uh, owner that you own <laughs> is in any way like 
registered or titled with the state. But on the other hand, when you look at the antiquity of the system and you know the all roads lead to Rome aspect of it and the papal bulls dictating that uh, all souls on the earth realm are subject to the pontificate <laughs> and they are needed, they need the salvation of the Vatican. And, uh, that just <laughs> on principle just makes me want to have nothing to do with uh, any of the game because it's such a clear attempt at, at sorcery. But, you know, at the end of the day, as I just stated, fiction is fiction and always will remain fiction and can never become reality. It can only just take on more and more of the appearance of reality for those who are sinking deeper into self-deception. So that's kind of my two cents. I don't know if there's a clear point. Yeah, I think that it's important to stress that there is that psyop aspect of it. The, the amount of psychological leverage that can be used against people. But again, the, these people that claim to be in the positions of power are also making claims on people's flesh and spirit. And I think that just looking at that, you have to at least say, well, I don't consent. Even if it's, I don't consent in your actions. So Sunday, I butchered 36 chickens. That's my non-consent. Today, I harvested a bunch of cabbage. That's my non-consent. Every day, I'm getting better at that. But until I'm able to completely provide and be in that one faith, that true faith with the creator, then I'm going to have those challenges and those temptations to use and rely on the commercial system. But right now, I'm learning. And I'm sharpening my iron with everyone else that's willing to do so. And I just I stand behind making a, making a truthful claim and standing on your square and being prepared to defend it. And I, I do see the utility in the public system because I see how sick our people are. We're, we're, we make medicine for the people. This is what I tell my son. We're bottling tinctures right now that we've been making over the past few months. And he's, he's like, what are, you, what are we doing? Making medicine for the people. Why? Because our people are sick at so many different levels. And so the, the key is to educate people and to make things available. And so I make, make the medicine available, make the education available, whether it's the education that, hey, you can go find these mushrooms in, in, uh, in the woods in a local park. You can go find these medicinal herbs in your lawn. It's, it's those steps towards sovereignty that begin to awaken the spirit within people. Because mm -hmm. if we keep people locked in the commercial system in their mind, that's the saya. That's the prison that people can't see the walls of is that money is a fiction. It's a transmitting utility for labor energy and also spiritual mental energy. It's, it's a, it's a, it's not one thing it's, but it is spiritual energy. It's chi. call it whatever you want. We're trying to transmit that to one another for the benefit of one another. And there seems to be this middleman. And this is what chance talks about a lot through the language Oh, you're kind of freezing up there, buddy. We'll give you a second to uh, for your internet We're, to catch up. Oh, oh, oh. I can Being. chime in lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to say in terms of the PSYOP aspect of it, it looks like James is getting unfrozen. I'll unmute him in a second. It was just a choppy robot. -y. Yeah, I, I do see one. The biggest and only PSYOP that ever really ever existed is all the various forms of the offer to be a victim. So when it comes to researching the law and the legal system, there is a huge offer uh, being handed out by many truthers that, <laughs> you know, this or that is the boogeyman and they're trying to come and get you or they're trying to hurt you or they're trying to steal from you. And it's always about that. Uh, and as Dylan just said, victim status is the blight of man. Oh, hey, so <laughs> I just think that obviously I don't think James is in victim mentality. He's taking as full responsibility as he possibly can. And I love that. Um, but, you know, I just say that so that we also can recognize that nobody is a victim, not even the one most deeply entrenched in the welfare state. You know, they can only ever pretend at being a victim.
-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that one of the most important things for us to bring ourselves the capacity to do is to be able to help our brothers and sisters. It, it is one of the timeless traditions is charity to your brothers and sisters. And that doesn't mean with uh, that, that you look down upon your brothers and sisters, but that you do what you can when you're able. And sometimes it is just as simple as a, a Oh, right at the good spot. It is just as simple as the. <laughs> I'm gonna get choppy again. Oh, uh, yeah. The connection issues will clear up, though. We'll get it. Uh, and there's my lovely lady saying that you're, you know, confirming that your remedy mushrooms healed her cold symptoms within the next day. That is true. I was pushing it on her, like, you know, take this, take it again, take it more. <laughs> so you're doing great stuff with the medicine, and now I want you to be able to finish that point. Yeah, so and you're this, awesome. And so the simple thing is that it can be as simple as just being kind to your neighbor and, and going to, to lend them a hand. It, this is a spiritual energetic exchange. And it is oftentimes the lowest things that we do, the, the most mundane that carry so much weight that we have no, uh, no long term vision to see. That, that we've impacted someone's life so so greatly. Yeah, I was just going to chime in there. First of all, James, that, that's amazing to the degree that you are assuming responsibility for so many things, your food, medicine for others, having the service to others in mind. It's the perfect trajectory, right? If everyone had that attitude, there would be so much uh, less suffering in the world, hands down. I totally agree with that. And, and I feel like we're in training for that because, you know, we're maybe five minutes before, we don't know how far before actually having to do that, right? We're not forced yet. It could be, you know, I was just talking in a store yesterday and somebody was telling me that uh, everything is two years behind and the companies are all fighting for this. Um, like there used to be 50,000 containers coming from China. Now there's 5,000, 10X down. And they're and they're fighting for the goods and the and the shelves have the two year old you know so that's just sort of a sign of the the degradation that is happening in the public, and but you know so if you train yourself now before you absolutely have to so that you know you yes you could just easily go to the grocery store I didn't need to grow a garden last year I didn't need to grow a garden this year I didn't need to work at a farm last year or this year I don't need to get involved with a market garden for the the year to come I didn't need to set myself up on uh, you know, in a, in a in a place where I could potentially bug out and live. And even the other day, I had to go and bring propane to uh, to a heater. And I could have, you know, found some strong man, I'm pretty sure I could have found at least one in, in Winnipeg to help me do that. But I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do this on my own or not, I need to know if I could do this on my own or not. And, you know, so I, I got in there and we, I actually did get help with that. If I couldn't carry the tanks myself, that they're hundred pound tanks, there's like no way, especially full, but uh, you know, with a little bit of assistance and uh, now I'm suddenly know how to use ratchet straps. <laughs> and I was like, mystery, is there a school for this? I'm saying to myself. And ratchet you know, straps in the dolly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the dolly. Yeah. Yeah. And the first time I drove away, actually, I I had somebody here and they and they helped me. They're like, oh, I'm good at straps. So they did the straps and I and I drive away and the tanks are doing this in the back. And it's like, oh, not good. I thought, okay, abort mission, it's over. But then I just jump up there and I'm like, oh, it's just loose. Ratchet, ratchet, ratchet. Got it going, got on the road, um, you know, got my way through. They, they actually were, it was illegal to help me with this the strapping of the tanks uh, on their end because if they failed, it would be a liability. And, uh, and then I get on the highway and it had been major storms for days already. And a good portion of the highway was black ice. You know, many, many things could have made me turn back. It was stressful. I ended up with a good migraine by the end of the day. I was freezing cold, but I got those tanks there. We hooked them up, got the needs met, did the job, drove away. And, you know, I found reserve and strength inside myself that I didn't know was there. And now I know if I have to do this under, like chances are it's going to be better conditions than, than what that was that day. And I have new confidence in myself that I can handle this. So, you know, I could have, I could have found 
uh, oh, please help me. Like I did the first time I need a man. And then the poor guy, he couldn't do the straps. I ended up doing the straps <laughs> <laughs> like an hour later. He's, I think I'm like, I think it would go this way. And I'm like, oh yeah. All right. And we're off now. But uh, yeah, the training is priceless. And and also uh, since Ben Balderson is here, I was, I'm curious what he would say about this, the middleman of the money, the fiction. So it's, it's really just the agreed upon. I think we all agree that uh, money has no life of its own, of course. And um, it's a it's a middleman, just like a resistor. And what does a resistor do? It would between the volts and the amperage is create the light, right? So is that potential the same there, where we can choose to use the resistor consciously as a way to meet our needs in a in a more satisfying way? And maybe you've got potatoes, and and uh, they don't want your chickens, but you want the potatoes. And if you have some means to translate value, I, personally, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, so, Ben, what do you think? Is that is that a, a good analogy of the money in the middle, or is is it? Uh, yes, Mercury does transactions. See, I think I'm onto it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, I think the the issue that comes forth from the usage of money is a property rights issue. Is that now we are not the we are not the issuers. It, it is a it is a centralized banking system, and so we we're not we have. Well, no let me add to on. that, James. Too is that they call people call money, you know, the Federal Reserve debt notes that are property of the Federal Reserve, but that's not actually money. This is money. This is silver right here. That is actually money. No, I am the only sole proprietor of this, you know, I'm the only one that owns it. There is no middleman in that. So the definition of money, if we're going to get into actual de legal definitions of things is, uh, let's go ahead and look it up. Money yeah. is coin, stamped metal, any piece of metal, usually gold, silver, or copper. So it is mm -hmm. saying that it should be stamped by a public authority as used as the medium of commerce but the uh, the third definition of money would be wealth or affluence so you know real money is different there wouldn't be any sort of uh, transactional confusion you get to decide you are the valuer right like that is worth this much of the metal versus sort of the artificiality of the prices on the markets but i actually want to take us away from the money topic and ask a question to the panel here so one of the things that I'm often presented with when I <laughs> bring up the possibility of like uh, <laughs> issuing offspring without registering them with the state is the knee jerk first thing is that is illegal. Uh, does anybody know and can confirm or deny the legality of that? Because I'm pretty sure Amish and Mennonites and other sorts of communities live that way all the time. Again, I'm going to go back to the principles. Power and authority emanates from the creator to man, from man to government, from government to corporations. If you put the government yeah, and what the most creator, people what most people call government to add to that is actually corporation. <laughs> yeah, Masquer yeah. There are corp municipal the corporations masquerading as government. And that's what most people are at this point, sort of def deferring authority to. But I draw, I draw this hard line distinction that if you are going to look for legality about the, about the creation of your child, you're already not on the right path for this. And I would just recommend not just educate yourself about how to utilize trusts in the public space and in the private. But if you're already looking at it as though they're going to what take your children away from you oh or are you gonna let them this is where i can't this is this is where i was getting earlier it's like it comes to would you die for your family because a lot of people won't and that's that's a true thing that you can go within and find whether you would do so and do not put the government before your family your family, your that baby's in there. That baby's coming out. If you conceive the child with God's blessing, that ch that child's coming out. 
Every, every child is a blessing from God. And it is our responsibility whenever we create that light to defend that light and to educate them and to bring them into the culture, the true culture that's, that, that doesn't have all of this overlay, this matrix, whatever people want to call it. And like I said, I draw hard lines and I know, I know it's not, uh, uh, um, Maybe not for everybody. <laughs> uh, you kind of cut out again there. We'll let you come back. Anyone else want to comment before we get James back in? Yeah, on, I, I'm, I'm very curious because it, it's exactly what they said to us in, with the census, that this is illegal. You could be um, fined or jailed for not, not uh, filling out a census form. And so there was a whole lot of us that went, mm, I don't think so. I'm not really answering some personal questions. And they sent a lot of notices. There was uh, two weeks. They knocked on my door every day, very aggressively. Boom, 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 a little bit like, we know you're in there, kind of thing. And I just held my ground and didn't do anything and, you know, waited for the summons. The fact is that they're, they actually um, can't charge you because they're not uh, addressed to you. It's to the household. There's, I'm sorry, there's nobody named household here. And uh, so it's, you know, and it, it's, it's a little different from the birth certificate, but I still have yet to know of a single anybody who's been charged for not registering a child. I like, has anyone heard of that ever? Maybe it's not that common, but um, you know, at no, the end the, of the day. No, the biggest just thing to quickly that finish. you'll get just, just to quickly, just to quickly finish it, uh, you know, there's so many things that I have been told I have to do. Again, another bank thing. So I went to take some cash out, and they're like, "You have to tell us what this money is for." I'm like, "No, I don't." So they go, they get the, they get the, this is in Canada. What's happening now? You try to take out more than their daily limit that they've arbitrarily given you, and you have to show them how you're going to be, be uh, using that money supposedly for your safety so someone doesn't come along and uh, extort you and then you go to the bank and get your money for them but um, you know so we had a big long talk and, and he, he, he glared at me and he was mean to me and then I went and got the manager and she glared at me and she was mean to me and uh, and I finally shot you like you have to tell us what this money's for and I said and I shot back at them this money is for my personal business I use the two words personal and business, so they couldn't, you know, argue with either of those. Co covered the waters, and they're like, nah, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. Well, we'll see if was, this works or not. And you know, at the end of the day, it was absolutely fine. The next person I dealt with was nice and kind, and it was just a straight transaction. Here's your thing. Here's your cash. So you know, again, it, you I came home from the the um, from Mexico early on in the pandemic. You have to go into that kiosk and let it scan your retinas, which they claim is not happening, but I'm pretty sure it is. And then I just thought, hmm, well, let's see. I I said I don't want to go in that machine; it gives me a headache. They're like, okay, just go right up to the front of the line then. And the lady thanks me for coming to the front of the line because she's going to lose her job to the machines, you know. So it, just poking holes and oh, you say I have to do that. Hmm. Well. Maybe not. <laughs> so just to support your point there, James. Yeah. So one thing that I learned from someone that was educating me about law is that it doesn't matter so much whether we believe it. It matters that they believe it. They being the, the people that will tell you, hey, no, you're going to have to tell me what you're using your money for. For whatever reason, that person is absolutely convinced that they are going to get that information from you and that they deserve it and that you're going to do it. And it, it comes to the, the point of, uh, of, of force some, for some people. And this is, this is why I keep stressing the faith aspect of this is because if we're going to be using the commercial system, you have to let your no mean no. And you do have to learn how to navigate those waters and say the right magic words. It's it, it seems like absolute insanity, but it's like, yeah, you have to become a magician and know the definitions of words or how to use them in the proper context, like personal business. It's on, on the face of it, it, it doesn't really mean anything. But to someone that is in a belief system, that's it's like uh, it's like twilight language to them. They're like, beep, 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 beep. Oh, yeah, personal business. I can't do anything. I got to go get my manager. This is our
it went, went to personal business. Oh, we lost you again. <laughs> These are not the droids you're I, looking for. <laughs> it's so funny, uh, Balderson's comment that James is on fire, but his internet is the dumpster. <laughs> uh, uh, Gabriel, you want to weigh in? Uh, well, congratulations, Beth, on having, you know, the verbal kung fu, because that's really what this is, you know. Uh, it it is so difficult, uh, but also a glorious challenge to speak impeccably. You know, once you've taken on the responsibility of knowing the power of words, you know, uh, in so many ways, I think back to before I knew how powerful words were. And I think, you know, how careless I really was. But one fun, just a fun reflection of the possibility of uh, how far that goes is like the term Cold War. We had a decade of Cold Wars, you know, and now here we are dealing with, you know, battling over colds. Uh, it's just kind of maybe the lesson is we should be very careful with the words we use. <laughs> I also feel it like I agree with you absolutely. And I also got myself out of word jail talking about that in my uh, house of free will meeting yesterday that you know the, they the people were correcting me don't say understand that means you stand under well and we had a really big amazing conversation about this word that it first of all that's my word how i'm using it, it's my intention i'm just because i say understand doesn't mean i'm standing under you now if i'm coming through the border and they say you're under quarantine and you can't see your son do you understand i'm going to say mm, Either no, I don't get it, or I'll say, yeah, I get it, and I'll still go about my private business how I do. But you know, at the end of the day, the 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 words are not our jail. It's the belief that the words are our jail that is the jail. That's that's my take on it. And you know, maybe when when you get into court, the court system, and and words definitely mean different things than they appear to like the word trust in the private compared to the word trust in the public, absolutely different. There's no, like the public trust has nothing to do with actual trust of your brothers and sisters being reliable. So you got to know what you're doing when you're in that arena and uh, you know, be responsible to that. But uh, yeah, I feel, I feel more, a lot more free. I'm not censoring myself anymore. I've allowed myself to reuse words that I was trying to cleanse out of my vocabulary. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just not, it, it's the mindset. It's like, I am free. I feel and believe and act like that. Uh, there's a good example of my, my friend Jacqueline Milne, who has livestock, and they moved a, an electric fence from a, a certain place. And they just moved it, I don't know, four feet further on than the fence had originally been. Well, those cows would not step past the original place. They wouldn't do it. Their mind said, there is a barrier here, even though I can't see it or taste it or anything. It's not there. But, you know, so we have to move beyond that and, and look and see where are we actually bound. And to me, you know, 99.9% .9 of it is right here. We bind ourselves. We take ourselves down. We're at war with ourself. If we weren't at war with ourself, then they couldn't take advantage of, of us and all the confusion that we put ourselves in. Yeah, the real way that words become a prison is in contradiction. But that's not necessarily about the whole circus of words that can mean more than one thing and synonyms and homonyms and more about contradiction between your thoughts, feelings, and actions and words. So, <laughs> you know, the, like the real nullification of your will is when you act against your true will and your true highest good, even though you're say you know, say one thing and do another. So yeah, self-deceit is the real war that must be waged to stop deceiving yourself yeah now, I, I agree with you it's like just painful and a bit 
you know, just silly to think like, I can't say the word understand anymore, <laughs> you know, like all this sort of nitpicky stuff when we're really just trying to communicate a thought from one mind to another mind. And if we can achieve that with whatever words pl uh, possible, then our intent is honored. But the other pr sort of prison of words you could say would be in the limiting of vocabulary. And so whenever we, <laughs> what I mean by that is like, you know, a uh, classical education used to mean that you were learning Greek and Latin and without uh, an expanded vocabulary, you're also going to miss all the clues of the interconnectivity of many different things. And that's a real, a real weakness for us. And so whenever <laughs> in our own community, we start getting sensory about like, you can't say this word, you can't say that word. Ooh, 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 that's the naughty magic bad word. <laughs> uh, that's like, in a way, the limiting of our vocabulary in the exact same way that slave masters of old would make sure that their slaves only had a vocabulary that allowed them to do their job without being able to imagine a better life than what they currently have. So I'm not accusing like truthers or people in the community of wanting to enslave each other whenever they tisk tisk about certain no no words but it is kind of on the same route as mental slavery to narrow and limit and shrink the vocabulary down further and further into one kind of dogmatic dimension we're so afraid of censorship but then we're doing it to ourselves just to support your point we censor ourselves right so yeah, yeah, and then, you know, it's better to just get creative with the uh, phraseology. Yeah, <laughs> like, neologisms. Uh, exactly, cowpokes instead of jabs and fun stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think the power that we're having to find within ourselves is the power of articulation, like be able to concisely bring about your point so that you can deliver it in. Uh, in a, in a short statement, I mean, the I I got hung up on understand for a little bit, but I did not want to stay there because I was like, well, that's not the only definition. That isn't the only perspective. Like we can think of definition as in like your ability to see depth in something, to see the the edges, to see the boundary conditions placed upon it. So that's kind of what we use definitions for: is to find the boundary condition of a thought. In, in uh, this particular context with words. And so we're just trying to find a good boundary condition, close the loop, here's the package, that's, that's the idea and the concept. Um, I, and it's, it's very important for us to start finding that sovereign capacity to create within ourselves because we can issue documents that have a lot of weight, like trust documents are some of the, uh, some of the most powerful contracts that we can make with one another. Um, you can make an agreement to lease someone's land um, or to hold that land in a trust for the benefit of the children of either the owner or the uh, or whoever's a party to the contract. There is the, the limit is our imagination and our creativity. And we can start to form these like a private contract association, a private community that confers certain benefits for your participation in the community. Um, but you have to participate for that. You'll get certain benefits. It might be land, uh, land use rights, or it may be, um, a, a place to stay. You get a place to stay for two weeks. That's the, that's the agreement there. It's as creative as we want to be with it. And so we need to start taking this tool and sharpen it and start to use it for our community's benefit and stop looking for, uh, a, a legislator to create what we want to fill, what we want uh, a gap filled for. Like we see a gap, let's go ahead and get creative in how we would solve that at a community level because if we try to do it at a national level, what we end up getting is something typically dressed in drag and a little bit ramble. <laughs> I just noticed the chat. That's a showstopper there, Jess. <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat it. Oh my God. <laughs> I've been listening to too much Big Bear. So I see somebody with a bear name in the chat and I'm just like, I have inside jokes. I'm I'm 
I'm in on it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I'm not sure where I want to take the conversation from here. We have such brilliant minds. I feel like we've done some pretty good justice to this topic, but James, where do you want to go? I kind of wanted to get into some more natural birth and uh, placenta gravy. Oh yeah. I think there are people that are here specifically Uh, for placenta gravy. Yeah, buddy. Let's ladle it. I know that's Gabriel's favorite holiday dish. Yeah, buddy. Serve it up. Yeah, I have lots to share on this subject. That that was what uh, hooked me. So. All right. So uh, take it away, James. I think you're unfrozen. I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of spotty. Um, honestly, I was going – I. I'm interested myself. I'm I'm coming to this completely again, um, because Elise has uh, given birth at home two times, and this past time she has uh, consumed the placenta as a supplement. And I would I kind of want to step out for a second if y'all could chop it up, and I'll uh, see if she has put a manual to sleep and see if she would like to come and talk about this because I would love for y'all to pick her brain. Yeah, buddy. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I figured she was probably a little occupied with the little guy. So, uh, Beth, you said that the subject of the placenta and the afterbirth hooked you or in some way drew your interest. I, I remember, I think, the first time I really started to think differently about law and the spiritual component of it was probably hearing from Clint Richardson talking about the legal system in the uh, in terms of how the bible is sort of occultly referencing the whole thing and uh, i got really interested and then found my way listening to some kurt kallenbach and it's all very it's you know we, we're all probably caught up on that stuff but uh beth what what are what are your thoughts before we get in with elise here yeah, it was uh, very interesting. I, I like talking about my birth. It was my one and only. And uh, I didn't know if I could have children. I had so much chemo. The doctors told me after that I probably would never get pregnant. And it's like, oh, thanks for that, uh, letting me know in advance so I could choose. But I had the miracle pregnancy. And my son just kind of zoom. He's like, okay, there's a moment and I'm coming in. And I had a lot, of, a lot of friends in the birth world, natural birth world, that themselves were doulas. They were studying uh, to be midwives, not medwives, you know, so you, you, you see through several levels of it because it's easy to think that, you know, hospital bad midwife, good. Well, no midwives are highly regulated by the system and they are very controlled and limited in what they can do. And really they're just being part of the medical system at a more like warm and fuzzy level. And so I knew too much when I got pregnant and I knew that I definitely was not going to have a hospital birth. And I tried hard to get a midwife just, you know, for some security or whatever at that, at that point that I felt like I needed supplement to, to the care. And um, there was this mishap of things and it turned out that I was too late. I couldn't get a midwife. So the guy, they, they, they said to me, oh, well, then you're just going to birth in the hospital. And I said, no, I'm not. And they're like, oh, well, now we have to uh, intake you, right? So it was a very interesting little um, just mishap how God was orchestrating things at the time. And as the pregnancy went lo- went along and it was friendly at first, but you know, they want to do the heart tones and they want to check you and they were, there's the, the, you know, the ultrasounds and all of this thing. So I systematically refused pretty much every kind of intervention that they could use uh, before or after I did end up with a, with an ultrasound. They, they scared me into it because I was very, um, not fat. And they didn't like that because I think they're used to seeing a lot of really large women these days. And they, they were, they were scaring me. Let's go see if there's anything wrong. There wasn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have gone for that ultrasound. That's always the game. Don't, don't beat yourself up though. You have a healthy, fine young man now. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And and I I don't know. That's the other thing is like humanity and the, the spiritual essence of what we are that manifests the material is so far beyond (laughs) Uh, reckoning that it takes like just mountains of poison brainwashing and self-deception to even make a dent in our natural vibrant health right it's very you know one little ultrasound ah 
Whatever. Yeah, no, and thank you for that. Exactly. If you don't mind, if I tell this story, it's uh, you know. So as the time went on, next thing you know, I got served papers from the midwives. They wouldn't even call me or tell me or send a personal letter, and they fired me from a home birth, serving like with a you know at, at the at the door with a, a service processor, and it was like, oh, this this is weird. And and my my rebel mind went like, okay, fuck you. I will just be doing this on my own. And then I thought, well. How, why am I going to let them get away with that? This is this is not even proper treatment within the system. So I made an appointment with them, went down, and I spoke a lot of truth. Well, next thing you know, they're both crying because they know how tied they are. They were like little babies and almost turning to me at that point to comfort them. And that you know, again, God was doing doing magic in the room, and uh, and they said, okay, well. If it turns out you, for some reason, have to birth in the hospital, we will attend your birth, but not at home. And it was so perfect for me because I had that, you know, I, I won't go into a, a staunch no to a hospital birth because what you are afraid of, you tend to pull in. This is this is a fact. So I got past all of my resistance. I packed a hospital bag, but I planned the birth at home. But I thought, okay, if I get any sign at any time that I need help, I was down the street from the hospital and I, and I would be ready to go. No problem. Just so that wasn't uh, calling in the wrong thing. <clears throat> I had dreams about uh, my baby being murdered in the hospital. And I had dreams that I pushed my, my midwives out of the birth space. And, and, you know, you could just see it sort of coalescing into this. What, what, what ended up happening when I went into labor is two of my five doulas were available. They both came, spent the day with me. It was very straightforward, although like not, you know, I won't go into detail. It was like, I was, it was considered a textbook birth and everything went really well. And, uh, and then my, my midwives ended up doing amazing postnatal care. They came in and they were just lovely and they looked after me and it was the best of all the worlds. But, uh, you know, if I didn't have all of that support in, in my life and knowing all of the things uh, that are very unfortunate can happen in the hospital to the mom, to the baby, um, and in fact, there's um, uh, a woman that I uh, am I'm starting to work with. I, I, she's public with her story, so I don't think it's a problem to let you know. But uh, she was she was hospital birthing, and she was almost dying. The baby was almost dying. They took her off to one hospital. They took the baby off to another hospital, and in two months, the baby died after a, a great deal of of torture. And and this set her off on a new life of assisting people to understand, you know, what they're getting themselves into when they they literally hand their bodies and their babies over to the system in that way. You you could do it in an empowered way. I know people who use the hospital system in a much more empowered way and they have advocates and they'll stand up and and say the absolute no, I don't consent and yes, I'll sign my life away, no problem for all of that, but for me it was better to not have to be in that arena knowing what happens when you're when you're there and how vulnerable, especially a new mom is holy. I never even knew the definition of vulnerability before that. And um, yeah, so everything went went quite well outside of the system. And, you know, it was a free birth. I literally had no medical intervention whatsoever. I birthed in water. Uh, there were, you know, there was still a complication. I'm not going to beat myself up with, with and chance I appreciate what you're saying, you know, something I would have done differently had I known. The cord, the cord uh, to the placenta was very, very short, and one of the doulas said we have to cut the cord. Well, this was like very bad for a baby. It is like suffocating them, unfortunately. And so he was starving for two years, and you know, nursed every seventy-five minutes for that entire time. I didn't sleep for two years, so you know, there there was an error there for sure. There, there, it was not true what she said that because the cord was short that we had to cut it. That was not absolutely not true. But I didn't have the authority or the knowledge to know the difference in that time, and uh, and she did that. So, but you know, I do have a, a very healthy son, and he hasn't had the the, the kid has never been. Uh, I think there was maybe I was trying to count in my mind maybe four well baby visits where we went and weighed him. And then I would just like, you know, they'd say, do this. I'd say, no, they'd say, do this. I'd say, no, they'd say, do this. And they'd say, no. And, and it's sort of, and then I thought, well, what am I doing here? What, why even go through this charade? And I stopped bringing him to the, the doctor. He has still never been to a doctor. He has never been on an antibiotic. He's never had jabs 
in his arms. And so it, it makes him, you know, miles, if it's not a competition, but miles ahead of the average child out there who's had such the onslaught, never had a, never had a Tylenol. Maybe he had one Tylenol at one point. I think he, re he received that for a fever at some point. But, uh, you know, real au oh, natural, and it, it, it's pretty beautiful. I feel, I feel proud of that, and yet I will judge no parent for having made other choices when they did. And, you know, you do the best you can with what you have. Uh, birth knows how to happen. It is, it is very much rigged in our favor. A force comes through you. It's not, it's not a mental plan. I had all kinds of plans in my head, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm just going to mantra my way through this birth. And it's like no screaming all the way. <laughs> Turns out it's screaming, uh, but it it is cared for that life life takes over. When I I I going into that, I thought mantras were so powerful. I came out of it going, they're nothing. They're a fiction. It's an it's a big fat nothing actually. Well, you know, I I don't want to speak for Elise, but I think maybe she will back me up here that uh, the issue with the mantra maybe is that it's almost like you're trying to use it to take yourself away from the discomfort or the pain. And I remember very vividly when we had Elise on Interverse that she said, your baby is in, in that pain, <laughs> go into it. Don't like try to avoid it. Not no judgment on you. You know, you're just doing the best you could in that moment. But, uh, uh Elise, do you want to comment on all that? And congratulations, Beth on the healthy son and no <laughs> unnecessary medical maiming and all that. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, birth really is a force, a force in itself. It's uh, a beautiful rite of passage that women get to go through, and then they also that men get to go through as well, being the partner and the father in it. And I, I do feel like uh, one thing I've been thinking uh, in my mind is how kind of in mainstream memes, I guess they say uh, like women need to take back from the man and the man did all this to us. And I, I hear that in different realms. And I've been thinking, well, if women are these portals of birth that have birthed it all, um, when did the woman fall prey to someone else telling her what to do and how to birth her baby and how to raise her child? Um, when did when did we fall behind on that because it is all in the woman's power and and this is where you get connected to your intuition where it's uh someone said like i remember as i was putting the baby down i was actually reading lies hospitals told women or midwives told women and i i followed this really fun page and so i was looking at that and um uh, When did we get fudged by the lies and, and when did our intuition get taken over by someone else's idea of logos? Like, oh, you know, the cord's too short. Like I had a woman tell me that uh, my cord was too short, so I couldn't even have a vaginal birth. Or, um, you know, you don't know where your baby's position is, so I have to tell you where your baby's position is. And this is where you get the surveillance state that is ultrasounds. Um, and yeah, I'm, I need more time. I, I was like laying down with the baby. I'm kind of tired, so let me, let me get a little higher on this conversation. <laughs> well, you, you know, you're I'm, doing great. Um, I love that you said the word intuition twice, because uh, I've been thinking about the uh, the witch trials and how the word intuition has the word witch in the word. You know, it, which is uh, kind of the thing that was has been vilified, or even you know, attempts have been made to breed it out. But like Chance said, it takes takes way more than what they got to throw at us. But yeah, I think the witch trials is a good place to kind of look at, you know, uh, some of the assault that's been laid upon the, uh, the baby making process, you know, on this land. Yeah, it's a time of unprecedented intuition, the, the pregnancy and the, uh, and the birth um, scenario itself that it, it's staggering 
you know, that your access to information is, is really different. It's quite a phenomena as far as I'm concerned. You, you, you know, there, I really fully trusted that if there was any message I needed to get, I could get it. I was, I was a portal for that. And uh, yeah, I, I can't stress enough that it's so important to really understand what your fears and resistances are in advance too, because I know a lot of stories from the natural birth world where women were very determined. This is how I'm going to do it. This is where I'm going to do it. This is how it's going to happen. And it was everything but because they had so much resistance to, you know, going the different path. So yeah, that's just something to watch out for. It's like, of course, good to have the intention for natural and uh, an interrupted births. But um, but as long as you hold those fears, they can manifest. What, what did you, uh, I can see you want to say something. Um, so I, my friend who, she was the first person that I knew that free birth. And I've asked her if I could tell her story and she's given me permission to, um, because it's, it's, a. this is where I'm like, okay, so obviously I, I'm not going to say obviously. So you said, you know, when you don't want something, sometimes you attract it even more. And I, I get that on one hand, but I'm also like, but what about the people that just stand in their truth and are just flat out, no, no, this is not my story. This will not happen to me. I will not go to a hospital. I will have a healthy baby at home. And so my friend, she hemorrhaged twice. The second time she's 38 and she had her baby at home and hemorrhaged. And she was like, Elise, I was, it was all black. And I, uh, her midwife was my first midwife. And she had told me this, where if you start hemorrhaging, you can bite on the placenta and it'll help stop the blood. Yeah, you have the hemorrhage. And she's like, I was biting all over my placenta. Nothing was happening. So I got the tocin and that stopped the hemorrhage. But I was a, it was all black and I was going. And then she moved to North Carolina a year later and got pregnant again. She's so she's in her latter age of 38, got pregnant within a year, and midwifery is illegal in North Carolina. And so she was looking around for a midwife and what to do. And she met Emily Saldaya of the Freebird Society. And she took her on as a client. And one of the first things my friend said was, you know. I'm a believer. Like I hemorrhage with both of my children. You know, I, uh, what, how can we remedy this? What can we do? And Emily was like, Oh yeah. If, if you believe you're a bleeder, then you'll only ever be a bleeder. Can you rewrite your story in any way? Can you have this sovereign birth where you don't need anyone else's help? Or are you just, are you just going to need someone's help? Is this your story? And uh, my friend had the most beautiful free birth at home. She had a baby boy. Free birth, um, free will. Free will is everything. It's all down to free will. I just wanted yeah. to comment that. Yeah. And um, and she, they had village prenatals in North Carolina. So the idea of a village prenatal is that uh, a group of women get together and just dote on pregnant women and just love on them and ask them if they need anything. And uh, most of the women in her village prenatal had hemorrhage prior. And so they kind of all unraveled their birth stories and were going through it. And she said, there was this one woman that kept saying, I really want a free birth, but the hemorrhage really scared me. Um, she kept bringing it up like she was tiptoeing around it, and she was a hospital transfer. She was the only woman in that group that had hemorrhaged and was a hospital transfer. Whoa. And I found that fascinating because I'm like, okay, so the power of the mind definitely does something. Like you can have a fear of like, no, 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 I don't want to go. Or it's like, and that's coming from a victim standpoint, or you can just stand in the power of, no, not happening, not the story, not going to do it. And that's, I think, the mind of, like, in Michelle's podcast, she asked me, what do you do if someone um, 
isn't if the the partner isn't for a home birth. And I mentioned to her like that's a bigger can of worms than just a home birth because the lifestyle behind wanting a birth like this is a holy, sovereign, loving, um, spiritual realm of it. And you can be like logical in it, I guess, and be like, oh, I only want a home birth because I don't want my child in a hospital. I don't want them to get poked and prodded and stuff. That could be it. But I, but birth transforms you. And so I think at the end of it, it might, you might see the spiritual aspect of it. But I feel like the mind behind home births, like a lot of them are like crunchy moms and don't use bleach and stuff. Like they just have a whole other mindset. Yeah, I think the one wild card in the picture is the unconscious. And you can't just take the conscious and put it on top of the unconscious and hope that stuff's going to go away. So, and, and you don't know each person's, I don't want to say destiny. It's not really the, the meaning of it, but what, you know, what they're, what they're calling in as their spiritual teaching, do they need to go through some hell? Does the baby need to enter in that way that they're, you know, somewhere they chose or, or didn't choose? I can't, there's no way to prove any of that stuff, but, uh, so you can you can be determined, but that can be um, more of willpower, which is not free will. I'm just making that distinction between you know when we want to will over, or will against, and um, and we use our will to suppress the unconscious because it's super painful, right? If you had to pass through the the death of yourself and the death of your child and all kinds of things in order to really truly you know, turn that fear into some kind of love. Most people are not strong enough to do that. We don't like pain, right? We were raised with painkillers and all kinds of ways out of our discomfort. And one of the ways out of the discomfort is, is to rise. And so this is something I have a lot of experience with. That's how I ended up with a stage four lymphoma. I was busy rising, doing the ascension path. And I was up, 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 and I was very high. And all of a sudden, my body was so sick. I had to drop absolutely everything. I lost everything. It took me three years fighting for my life. And so it taught me that no, this, this path has to be inside the warriors to go and you know feel all the experiences that I don't want to feel, stop suppressing, stop using my free will to suppress, and then have to go muscle in the world and push around the elements in order to get my way, whatever that is, whatever the you know, the motives you often find are not clean for the thing that you want. And so it's not as much about the, like, should I birth in the hospital or should I birth at home? Of, of course, if you say you're asking my advice, I'd be at home all the way, 100% about it, like a thousand reasons why you should be in the in this comfort, safety and privacy of your own home. But at the end of the day, it's we're here for freedom and whatever that takes so that we have the experience of free will, not just the unconscious, haphazard, you know, willy-nilly version of that. And uh, anyway, that's my big subject. <laughs> I love what you just said, and I want to make my own addition to it because you're describing how free will does not mean bypassing or repressing something in the unconscious. And when we talk about the unconscious, like for me as a, biofield tuning practitioner, I'm, I'm literally in people's unconscious. <laughs> I'm like waving tuning forks around in it. So I know what happens is that the, uh, whatever the like sad situation is, is also going to be attached to some kind of belief and some kind of victimization. And so to just say, uh, to just try to suppress or whatever would be akin to like not doing the work to, and what you can do. So what I mean, let me put this more succinctly. Instead of using the free will to bypass or repress it, when it comes to authoring your own story, you have to still take ownership of the story so far. <laughs> it doesn't mean like you can wave a magic wand and your actual life path goes that you got to how you got to where you are can somehow be altered. But what you can alter is your relationship to it. So like, the example would be 
I actually, I had a tuning client today who we found, uh, well, there was like heart chakra energy that was stuck for a variety of reasons and some really heavy duty stuff in this person's past, like very traumatic stuff. And the one thing that I usually do when I know that the heart chakra has a lot of grief to release or a lot of sadness or a loss to release is I tell them, please ask your own body and the intelligence of your own body, which is like talking to your unconscious. So this is the proper application of free will to not bypass. Please, and you, anyone can do this at home, <laughs> ask your own body. I think actually you could call this like some sort of variation on the release technique that uh, my friend SB told me about learning from you, <laughs> Sean, shout out Sean Alger. And so I've kind of like incorporated this method into the biofield tuning where I say, ask your heart if there's any grief or loss that can be released. And then um, I find the spot, I'll find various spots in the energy field and I'll be like, okay, What's the thing? What's the thing at age seven? What's the thing at age 14? What have you? And the one that was like really big for this personal, this person that I was working with was a, uh, an abortion as a teenager, like a 14 year old, really tough. And there was other aspects to it. So what you do when that is ready to come up for release is I have them visually. I walk them through going to the 14 year old self and meeting them in your mind, showing them love, forgiveness, and acceptance. And uh, it's pretty much a guarantee that they're going to be like in tears uh, from walking through that process. Because there's like, you know, the, rep the using free will to bypass and repress means uh, judging the old version of yourself. I'm not like that anymore. That's bad. I don't talk about that. I don't think about that. The using free will to accept to forgive, to show love. That is how you transcend and change the story. You don't change what actually happened, but you change your relationship to it. And then at that point, then you can do something different. Like for this client in particular, now you can go forward without chronic respiratory issues where all that grief is living in your lungs. Now you can, now your voice can come back to full strength. Like many, many things are going to be a cascading uh, empowerment set of consequences from the uh, uh, proper application integration using the free will. So, you know, that's an important caveat that like, you know, that story of that at least shared of, you know, is that your story? Are you a bleeder? She probably needed to go deep within and find all the threads that made that story and find acceptance for herself and find, and not, you know, not be in fear of the possibility of if it happens again. And, you know, there are some, there, are, there's things to that, but it is also kind of simple. Uh, it, it's more about like, it's about holistically connecting all the dots and that was pretty verbose. So I'll kick it over to Elise, but. <laughs> that was great, I, by the way. I enjoyed that. Oh, I appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the sort of release t training that I got from Sean from having conversations with him about that. It's a very helpful piece of the toolkit. That's awesome. Very Which good. is simply just like asking for it, <laughs> you know, ask for it and then like make the, do the actions to support the, uh, the request so that it can come through and it, it does wonders. Yeah. We were never taught. I'll just jump in really quickly. This is our operating system that God has given us and we can interact with it. We can speak with it. We can dialogue with it, we can give it instructions. We're used to actually taking instructions from the unconscious and you need to flip it around because the unconscious is not qualified to take care of your life. It's an automation. You, you, it has no actual life or volition or free will of its own. So by putting yourself in, in the hands of it, then you're, you're like, you know, in very shaky ground. So anyways, I'll turn it over to Elise. Yeah. Whenever I was pregnant with Josh, I told my excited midwife for him, I told my midwife, you know, I really, I heard birth just like breaks you open. So I'm hoping it'll fix all the stuff inside of me. And she's like, yeah, you really better get your shit together before you get birth. Cause that's not how that works. And, uh, yeah. Like using your, it's like a psychedelic. It's going to, it's going <laughs> to really shake all those cracks. It's not going to seal them. Yeah. And that's when you get people that are like, I'm never going to touch that again. 
I had such a bad time. But did you met the parts of yourself that you thought uh, that you didn't know were there, that you never saw, and you left them out in the corner. And so always, always, something we talk about often is death and um, the death of an idea or the death of ourselves or of our children. Like I, whenever I did Chance's podcast, I talked about how I saw myself die with, uh, oh, never I was giving birth to our child three separate times in dreams. And um, that's kind of, always where I get with women is what are you afraid of? Like you're going to die. Everybody's going to die. You might not know when, but it's going to happen. And so what, what's something that you change in your life right now? If you were going to die tomorrow or what's something not tomorrow. I mean, you can't really make that much, <laughs> that much change if you're going to die tomorrow. But, uh, but you know, like what, what's, do you find yourself a victim in any way, shape, or form? Because if you do, it's going to come up in your life and in your birth and in your whole pregnancy and postpartum as a whole. Like I see how I still held on to a victim consciousness with Josh's pregnancy and birth. And a lot of people have a deep-seated unconscious victim down there that always comes up, whether it's they did it. Something's always happening to them rather than them being in flow with the world. And I feel like one thing that I think of is how Topher says um, frequency is location. So if you're vibrating at that frequency, why would your location be I'm dying in a hospital or something like that? I, I don't know how I'm going to die, but if I believe frequency is location, then I should have some direction as to where I'm going. So uh, what you just said actually is perfect way to conceptualize why it is necessary to go back and do this like release or integration of stuck energy in your unconscious or your biofield or however you want to conceptualize it because if that frequency of a traumatized eight-year-old or a scared 14-year-old or any of the above is in your energy field, then you are literally in that place still. <laughs> like that look, like you're carrying that location around with you in a way. So, uh, you know, yeah. you can't, you can't hide from it. It needs to be, it needs to be, it needs to be brought back into balance. Yeah, it's going to call your attention until it gets it. And it's going to call it a variety of levels. You know, you mild. stub your toe, then you break your foot, then you get in a car wreck, then your house burns down, then you get cancer. Like it'll get in, you know, there'll be quakes of intensifying severity until you finally get the memo. And that's what is so helpful about getting into the language of the body and how it communicates with us is because it, it is actually very gentle and subtle. Uh, up until the point where you've not been listening, not been listening, not been listening, and it starts to shake you more and more. Yeah. And it's totally rigged in your favor. I feel like I always have to make this point, not that not you said any different, but it's, it is for your absolute benefit. It's for your freedom that that pain would be there in, in the small and the bigger and the, and the monumental scale. It's all working for you. It's all energy since uh, working with Ben in the last couple of years, you know, I talk about it like it's EMF. That pain is the, is the, is the actual force that you need. It's just not available to you or it appears to be unavailable to you because you haven't come face to face with it. The simple thing, you haven't felt it. You haven't noticed it. And, and this is a realm that is highly weaponized against us. Uh, you know, there are people, I've got a, a big range of people right now in uh, my Find Your Sacred Purpose course, which I consider to be a, a kind of a beginner in, into this realm of releasing and, and transmuting en energy. And, uh, you know, so you've got people that are, they've done a lifetime of work on themselves and they're ready to dive in and they, they can already feel, they can sense releasing. All you need to do is, is uh, suggest a prompt and they're like, oh, I'm on it. And, and they're just releasing like crazy. And then you get the other end of the spectrum where they can't, they can't find a single feeling. 
not one, right? It's been so intensely uh, suppressed because of the pain that we would maybe normally have pain, but it's so much exponentially off the charts, the level of pain that people generally live in and then have to suppress in order to, because they feel like they won't survive it. But, you know, in reality, if, if that's you, you know, if you're, if you're uh, feeling numbed out is, is, you know, it's a kind of apathy in that realm, just know that it's all there for you, that, that the, the creation will never overcome the creator. You created those experiences inside yourself, maybe, um, you know, without conscious awareness, using your free will, as a way to create like the, the wrong kind of armor, not the armor of God, but that, you know, keeping the world out, keeping your feelings out, keeping your experiences at bay. But when you turn that around, you do the U-turn and you start receiving, that's how I survived cancer, right? I stopped getting out of my experience and I went in finally. And that's where I found healing. That's where all of the energy was waiting for me just but so, um, not but, but uh, waiting to work for me. That's why it needed my attention. That's why I created all the circumstances that I didn't want. So I would finally, okay, now, you know, I don't have a job. I don't have a home. I don't, all my friends are gone. And I'll just be 100% doing this work. I don't care how long it takes. This is, this is the project. And I was able to recover my life that way. So that's my big speech. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a powerful message. Uh, everything's working out best case scenario. Uh, really, whenever we have ears to hear, we're, our feet are already on the path, but we can get, we can listen for some direction. And it comes in, uh, it, it comes in people in our lives. It comes in directly in our bodies. But um, we're, we're so desensitized um, with the amount of things that you can fulfill your desires with a lot of people are on the trip of fulfilling desires instead of on the trip of fulfilling themselves and almost like so, sensation is not feeling yeah <laughs> in yeah interesting yeah. way and, it, and it's funny because you can feel that if you do like self-massage in any way is that the sensation may be painful at first but that's not the deep feeling you can actually have this real uh catharsis emerge from opening up a, a, a space of pain within a muscle somewhere. And I also want to touch on this pain thing, since we're talking about birth, where um, a lot of people view birth as a painful uh, situation that happens to them, rather than like a blissful ecstatic state that's only talked about in small groups of birthing women. And I always like to put this out here that birth you choose you can choose for birth to be painful or you can choose for it to be ecstatic. Like I see how my victim consciousness made my birth with Ja painful, but with Manu there was no pain at all. I was just hanging out, felt like I kind of had to poop. So <laughs> uh, I really always like to drive that point home is that sometimes we. We choose the pain because we like the pain. And it doesn't have to be painful. It can be a beautiful, orgasmic opening. <laughs> <laughs> I love that word choice. That's a beautiful word choice. Uh, the, word, uh, the word orgy and orgasm and all of those things, uh, they do. They relate to like uh, labors in Greek, don't they, Chance? Or gone also. Yeah. They relate to labors? I don't know. Actually. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Hercules endeavors, his 12 labors, they have a Greek word that is like the root word of orgy. I think the word orgy relates to the word endeavor. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. I think that the original meaning of orgy had something to do with like, uh oh like work yeah work <laughs> but yeah. like that i think it was related i'm just totally talking out of my uh, -huh. uh backside right now but i think it had to do with like uh, coming together of m initiated minds for a purpose rather than the sort of degradation of the the uh the concept you could say or just shifting of the concept i don't know it depends on what you feel is is, is and isn't moral but 
that idea of uh, orgone energy or orgasmic sensation, which is maybe kind of even beyond, it can it can flow beyond p- c- like physical sensation and into a true feeling or consciousness level if we allow it to. And I think that's why we have that ORG root in the word of uh, original, <laughs> origin, orgone, orgasm that we're tapping we're talking about tapping into the primary essence of what it is to exist and that's something that i try to help people rediscover in tunings is in particular when there's issues with the sacral chakra that the original state of your of feeling in being a in a body is orgasmic like not in a sexual way, but just like it should, or it originally did feel really good just to (laughs) exist in your body. And what has happened with all the blockages and like Beth said, to the point where some people can't even find a feeling anymore, uh, that (laughs) when you shut down that sacral energy, that, uh, you know, that inner fire, that original life force flow, you are you know if it's in a low level you're going to get into pain if it's off you're going to get into numb and when you're numbed out like that it's <laughs> that's when you get start moving into the the fully automated or autistic existence where there's so much energy uh, tied up in your unconscious that the unconscious actually begins to animate and and take over like a a zombie and I think that's why the metaphor of the, you know, the the dead, is so often used to describe the fictional personhood because there is very much like this. That's what makes the law aspect to like circle back around to the, this a spiritual pursuit is to realize like what is driving, you know, what what order of operations am I doing things in, you know, what is the jurisdiction? Is it uh, you know, am I am I putting things in the proper order of authority here? Yeah, man. Could I backtrack slightly uh, on the subject of pain? And when I was in India, I went eight times, and they have a tradition there of the the babies. They massage them right away uh, for the purpose to massage the sensitivity out of them, which is kind of interesting, right? So now I did a lot of work getting into my body still still working on it 20 years and there came a point where i would bring my consciousness right into my flesh and my bones and uh for the first while it was very now you could say painful it was like mm, there was there was like it was i would touch down it and i'd have to and i'd touch down it again and then it got to a point where it's kind of like the cold water everybody's putting themselves in don't do that by the way <laughs> just kidding and um, and then and then you you climatize like oh this is what it feels like to be in my flesh and my bones this is this is the experience that may have been you know dissociated for one reason or another certain parts of the body that you don't access with your consciousness but I think th- I think there is an inherent pain to it At the, uh, it's sweet pain it's the pain of life the pain of awareness. It's the same thing when, you know, when there's something, the first thing that happens, I often use this example, say you fell asleep on your arm and it's asleep. What's your first sensation that you're going to wake up to? Some kind of pain, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a beacon, a signal. It's like there's life here. There could be more life here with your attention. <laughs> well, it's kind of <laughs> like, you know, I heard this on Crow today when he's talking to Clive, love when he has Clive on. And they were talking about how when you take certain supplements, that your body's never had before, it might taste really nasty. That's the pain. But then once your body begins to recognize what's good for it, it'll actually start to give that uh, supplement a sweet or an enjoyable, you'll start to enjoy the taste, right? Mm -hmm. So the same is true for any kind of uh, (laughs) waking up or arousal of our energetic systems. Lifting heavy weights, it might be painful at first, but you'll get to where it's you know, you enjoy it. And exactly. I think that's, you know, the difference between, uh, you know, we, we're, we're kind of one back to the limitation of language, that idea we're super limited because we just have one word 
pain or discomfort when, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a, a bazillion varieties and reasons why you might have a particular feeling or sensation. And when we lump it all in as pain, similar to how we lump in, you know, all these varieties of effects of, of plants and chemicals and call them all drugs, <laughs> that's insane. Or that we call it every form of love including, you know, lustful or uh, friendly or like there's just this one word, love. We really uh, do need to, it behooves us to be more specific with our language, however possible. That is, at the end of the day, what helps us free our mind from limiting concepts. One of, one of my favorite lessons I ever learned in like uh, beneficial pain uh, was in massage school uh, lifetimes ago was a, uh, uh, skin rolling. Have you guys ever had anybody do skin rolling on you? Particularly on your back. Like skin rolling on the arm, meh, that's child's play. You get somebody to do skin rolling on your back the first couple minutes, it and it, it hurts just like it sounds like it would. But after two or three minutes of skin rolling, you are begging for them to do it again and to go back over the parts that they already rolled. Because for some reason, like the first time it hurts, but the second time it's like absolute heaven. And then by the end of the session, you don't want them to stop. It's a very strange, very strange thing. But yeah, therapeutic pain is a very real thing. That's so interesting. Wanna... It's like once your consciousness is drawn there, once your awareness is drawn there, you are like, oh, wait, that's a hallway to this, this big house that I inhabit that I forgot that I closed the door to. Absolutely. Yes. And another funny thing in, in massage school, they sometimes, if it's something you've never had done before, or like a place that people don't have massaged very often, like their armpit, they call it virgin territory. And I just think that's kind of funny. That's a funny term, but it is. It's like you said, it's like uncharted terrain, you know, or a, a whole dimension of physical healing that you never knew you'd uh, wander into. That's great. I want to also make the point of you know, there, there's pain of injury and then there's pain of growing. They're both equally excruciating. And then there's pain that, that so many of you have talked now about the victim thing that the, you know, the pain comes from apparently the outside and is caused to you. And then there's the pain and the discomfort that you give yourself. Now, this is different when you injure yourself. This is not what I'm talking about. But when you cause yourself to grow, and you step out of your comfort zone, even though you don't have to at all. It's a, a choice. And I often am joking, like people ask me, how am I doing? And I say, well, I'm making my own trouble. I, I have trouble like everybody else, but I'm, I'm clearly the one who makes it. Best example was writing my book, like what a pain in the ass that was. Oh my gosh, that was a pain. A <laughs> lot of pain. More and more pain than I signed up for. If I knew how much pain there would be, I would never have done it. And I wanted to blame somebody for that pain. I had, you know, all kinds of people helping me that were going sideways and, you know, four editors later and just craziness. And, and I was so tempting. They had gone wrong. They did wrong things. And it was very tempting to, to just blame them and put it on them. And then I thought, you know what? Actually, I'm the one who wrote the book. I did it. It's all my fault. And I took it on and I went through the pain of it. And then, it, you know, it could very easily move forward and keep going. So that, that's my policy with life. I create my own discomfort. And then life doesn't seem to have to take me down and out the same way. I swear. I get No, that's spent. super true. Like, you know, <laughs> suffering by choice or suffering by consequence. But either way, it was still by choice. <laughs> uh, so, guys, I'm going to move us towards the, the wrap up here. Uh, you're talking about the pain of uh, writing your book. That makes me think of something funny. I just, uh, we just submitted me and Dylan uh, Sakoshio the audio book for his fourth book that uh, took me a while to get through it. Had to do a lot of learning of alphabets and pronunciation, but we submitted that and Amazon emails him back and says, we can't accept your submission because the narrator uh, in the opening and closing credits mispronounced his own name. Like they're telling me how my name should be pronounced. Oh my God. <laughs> so anyway, just think that like, those are the kind wow. of like funny little pains of, uh, I just mostly laughed. I was like, how dare you? 
Standard I operating. Mr. My own name. <laughs> standard operating <laughs> gaslighting. Thank you very much, Amazon. Yeah, seriously. So uh, we just resubmitted it exactly the same way, and we'll see if maybe like a different stooge gets to approve it. But super funny, and uh, I want to make sure though that Elise and James have a- opportunity to say anything that may have, as of yet, been unsaid. We'd love to talk to you guys again. And, uh, but you know, let's move our way towards some wrap up and, uh, closing thoughts and make sure it include, you know, as you're finishing up your thoughts, where people can find you and what is on offer right now over at family fungi. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, one last thing about pain that I want to say is that the, idea that you can choose something to not be painful or it to be excruciatingly painful that's more in your relationship with pain so one thing that we always say is people need to put a burden on themselves or like you need a burden in some way like you need to be comfortable with discomfort um that way you can almost transcend the idea of this being uncomfortable Uh, Whenever I was younger, I did the, I worked out with this guy. We did natural workouts. We would like climb trees and hold logs and like dig in dirt and stuff. And he gave me two four by fours. He's like, I want you to be able to walk around with these like you don't even have them. And that's how I view pain a lot of the times. And I think how we, how we see it as well. But it doesn't really have to be that way. But it will be if you if you want. So that's that. And that's it's pretty interesting that uh, the thought that struck me was that pain and like pain of glass, like pain is this semi permeable membrane, but the what can go through can go through. And so whatever makes it through is the is the truest essence that can be. And it is not affected or uh, tampered with by that pain, but That's it brilliant. You know it. Wait, what was that? That's brilliant. <laughs> and, That's, and so it's, That's brilliant. It, it's, it, it's interesting that we can generate all of this, uh, all of this energy as a community, just through conversation. And so I, I trust that this inspires all of the listeners and all of the panel to be able to move forward in their respective areas of pain with trust and faith and a high degree of courage that what can make it through will. And so that can help you start to shed a lot of your own uh, psychological BS that is too weighty to make it through that pain. Man, that is gorgeous. You got me looking at the screen that we're on right now. This four section paneled, is like a window pane. And you know, it, we all have a different tone of color to our lighting of our rooms that we're in. You know, that's gorgeous, man. I love that. That is so wonderful. Man, that's great. The window pane. So that, what we see through. God. All right. Well, uh, no, that's that's so accurate. It's unbelievable. It is, <laughs> like, man. That's, that's going to take forever. To that's exactly what pain is there for. It is a it is a message. It's a portal. It's like showing you where your attention ought to be flowing. And it's, honestly, as soon as you put your full attention and go into the pain, whether it's I mean, I can't speak for giving birth, but whether it's giving birth or stubbing your toe, it changes the nature of the experience completely. It yeah. can, and it can even become ecstatic in, in, in some cases. God, and it, it makes is, me think of like doing squats with a heavy bar, uh, <laughs> in a weird, in like a almost in an almost like orgasmic way, the sensation of the pain and strain in the, the glutes and thighs, when you're doing super heavy weight on squats, it feels really good. It hurts so good. <laughs> and that's not to become like a weird sort of like sex pest, uh, well, you know, with pain stuff, but it's but just th- that there's only everything is to our benefit that nature ever provided, including all forms of uh, feeling and sensation that are in the range of potentials of our body. Think of the grunting sound that you would make in all of the situations. Like it's the same sound you would make 
be it orgasmic, childbirthing, lifting weights, or just thinking of something, you know, that's a, a heavy weight on your soul. You know, it's all of the same. For me, it was at least, you know, the same Wookiee roar is required for me. That's beautiful. Uh, so one of the hanging chads I've been sitting on, uh, I, this week I looked up the uh, definition of the word radical. And radical, very simply, uh, it has many definitions, but in like the first five or six right off the top, it basically just means pertaining to or having roots. And that is so profound to me in the conversation of the placenta. Wow. Radical and origin basically are synonymous terms or related terms. Back to the or ORG of it all. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Radical. So, Implant. I'm looking at Webster's 1828 right now. Pertaining yeah. to the root or origin, original, fundamental, as a right. radical truth or error, a radical right. evil. Right. Two, we implanted by nature, native, constitutional, as the radical moisture of a body. Yeah. Right. Three, primitive, original, underived. Wow. <laughs> Uncompounded. Serve, four, serving to origination. Uh, five, in botany, proceeding immediately from the root. So, like, when you're getting radical, you're getting as close to God as possible. Radical. Isn't Ooh, that Watch out for them radicals. Yes. And so, in the, in the most fascinating way, we all know that we would be labeled as radicals. But the beauty of that is that we are all enthusiastic about understanding and communing with our own roots, you know, tapping into the ancestry, tapping into the placenta, the basket, the cesta, the cesta que trust, you know, the bounty of the knowledge that has been overlooked for so long. And so I just think it's really something to like, look at the word that somebody's going to call you. Somebody's going to call me you radical and be like, Oh, you got no idea how radical I am. Let me sit you down and tell your ass what radical is all about. You know? Uh, so, yeah, that's something to really appreciate. You and consider, radicalize like, them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, so that that's just a fun tool for people to kind of uh, think about and consider uh, going into the holiday season. Who knows what conversations are going to pop up? But, yeah, radical is a beautiful word. And maybe, you know, we need to convert some uh some people to our radical agendas <laughs> radical bro it's been a pretty radical episode 69 bro nice. yeah, take your 69, roots in deep. dudes take your roots in deep everyone um so just kind of to move towards the close um we just pressed a lot of remedy tincture that is going to be available on our website Say remedy tincture yeah i did yeah, right here, the uh, lion's mane, reishi, chaga, shiitake, turkey tail. Make, your screen, make a screen big so we can see. Oh, yeah. I, I will show you guys what it looks like while I take this plant medicine right now. Oh, very nice. Oh, Remedy. how beautiful. Yep, very beautiful, beautiful packaging. I like it. Yeah, the you scales were very both have really good packaging. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, so the scales were very intentional to be a subconscious trigger to rebalance. Right. Right then. So that's that's the journey that we're all personally on is finding our balance within ourselves. Um, because the pendulum swings both ways, the scales tip both ways. And so we have to find ourselves in that center point that is unmoving, that is immovable and is the axis by which those two extremes can even be there. That's truly radical. Um, so we're, we're currently doing some building on our farm. So any amount of support goes towards that. Um, it's a house. We're trying to build a house. <laughs> and I'm the carpenter. So. <laughs> it's like Jesus. Uh, <laughs> not like. <laughs> but, but yeah, so we, we do what we can to provide potent medicine for our community because it's what we're using for ourselves as well. Um, this is the way that we can produce something of value and not have to have some BS job. Elise stays home with our children. I'm home with them. Of course, I'm having to work and everything. We're actually in the bathroom of our main building right now. 
we have a tiny house and it's kind of chilly so we're not trying to heat two spaces so we already have to heat this space so we're all just kind of crashing in the mushroom homes so um so any amount any amount of help goes towards our family it, uh, family fungi family first mushroom second but they're together so this is the this is the life that I, I want to say we chose because I do feel like I've put my willpower towards it as well. But also... Um, it feels inevitable. Like, we chose it, but I'm also like, Ooh, hands up on the hands ride. Hands up on the ride because, <laughs> man, take it easy. But take it, as Terrence McKenna said, because, man, it's, it's just going to continue coming. So we have to... And that's every day. Each day will be here. That is what we have. That's... That's the blessing. That's our guarantee from our creator is that tomorrow is our, is, is the gift waiting to be open. Um, but we have to act in the present. And so um, any, any amount of support goes. Well, we got that internet drop out for a moment there. We'll let you, I'm gonna let you finish. I'm gonna let you finish, but. <laughs> Before I let you finish, I'm going to say thanks to Matthew over on Rockfin for the uh, very generous super chat. He says, I awesome conversation and perfect timing um, for my wife and I. Cool. Baby number two should be here any day now. Congratulations, Matthew Solid. over on Rockfin. And thank you for the very generous super chat. So yeah, you can uh, reach us through our email at familyfungi.net. On Instagram at Family Fungi, and then also on Instagram at the Outpost Homestead. That's more of me just sharing what we do. Day to day homesteading. Yeah, yeah. We we call our our place the Outpost because it's it feels like we're on the fringe of our of even our own awareness, and we're just trying to help people find beyond the pale. It's okay. If you just need to come chill at the outpost, you can hang out here. But if you want to go beyond the pale into the unknown, well, here's some provisions. And, uh, and you know, whatever we get off into spiritual realms, it's it's helpful to, to have a place to come back to that feels like home. We have a, a kid that works for us. He's 18. And James went on a tangent today. And I was <laughs> like, we need him to work for us. Please stop. <laughs> Radical. Radical. <laughs> you radicalizing young minds over there. <laughs> uh, you you guys are so much one. fun. You guys are such a lovely family. I'm really grateful that I got to meet all of the entire gang at the Bertaria Festival earlier in the year. Super excited for the next time that we all get to share space. And I know it won't be too much longer. I love you guys very much. Beth, how uh, can people find you and what's new over in your world that I see that you've got your Haofu, House of Free Will <laughs> tag on your name there. Um, and also, before I let you go, thank you for being here as well. Thank you for that impromptu drop in with us. I love it. You were the perfect you know, extra voice on the panel and it's great to be able to share some screen time with you again. My very wonderful friend, Beth. Thank you. I could feel it coming somehow, Chance. Like I, because I was just entering into my uh, my zone, and I'm like, okay, is there an interview that I could have Chance on for or something? And then your invitation came, and I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm happy to come on King Hero. I got, of course, I got things to say. <laughs> of course, you do. I know you've got a lot. You got a lot going on. So we'll nail, nail something down for that. If people don't know, then that is my podcast, The King Hero's Journey, that uh, I feature the ones that are radical. And they're willing to get, I love the word. I'm all over it now. It's so great. Uh, willing to get out and, and do things. It's solution based. I don't want to blow my own horn, but honestly, you know, sometimes you'll get 90% of the problems and 10% solution. I'm all about the solution. There's, we have no time to t talk about problems anymore. We all know what the problems are. So I very much appreciate hearing everything that you guys have said, because this has just been a full, full on solution. And uh, yes, the house of free will. I was uh, very, very happy when I when I found that name. Free will is my highest ideal and value in in life. And I've been gathering community. It's a very slow, you know, process because it's not just like oh, put up a sign up link and anyone who wants to join can do that. It's by application. You have to really be a good fit for the ministry. It is faith based, but I don't uh, keep anybody out. That if you're attracted to be part of it, 
then I, I will trust that, that you don't need to be, you know, Bible lover or anything like that, where you, everybody's coming at the Bible from a different place. And I'm super innocent because I really don't know a whole lot. I can't sit back and, and give you doctrine of any kind. It's just not like that. Uh, but we have some very beautiful discussions. There's a lot of uh, support that people can get. All of my work in coaching is over there. So if you want to study about archetypes, you want to learn how to not just navigate your own unconscious and harvest that energy that's tied up. You can also train to become a coach working with archetypes and the deprogramming tools that I teach. This is my all-time favorite. My students who are trained to be coaches, they do the deepest work of anybody. It's amazingly inspiring for me. I really love that. And uh, I'm just finishing the Find Your Sacred Purpose course. So if anybody feels like that, you know, that was a subject I didn't think anyone was interested in a couple of years ago, but it's probably the hands down the biggest one without it. With two emails, there ended up being 54 people in this last class. And I completely revamped it this time, just uh, bringing it up to date with my own uh, awareness, my own skills and, and knowledge and how I express that. So I have made it a Cadillac version really thorough and uh, something that someone who was a beginner could come along and make use of and, and with any luck, you know, be able to start changing their own life. So that will be up at my website. You can go to um, freewillministry.live, L-I-V-E. It's all, also the same as, I know it should be live, but I like the live part. And uh, it's also the same as bethmartins.com. So you, all of those roads still lead to Rome, if I can use that expression. <laughs> Roma, which is uh, amor. Love mm. in reverse. Ah, I like that. All invert. roads do lead to love. There Indeed, you go. They do. There you go. So thank you so much, Chance, for having me on. It's been a pleasure to, I know I, I check in on you guys periodically, not often enough, but uh, I knew our time would come. <laughs> it just felt right. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel, where they find you, my man? Uh, Slick Dissident on YouTube is my main little project, shared learning experience over there. Uh, I'm also on with the Weaving Spiders webs on uh, Saturdays, weaving on into Sundays. Uh, those are my main jams. And uh, I've been on one on one quite a bit, so I give him a shout out. I think we got a couple uh, little shows on deck going to come out in the next few days. So, yeah, Beth, it has been an absolute joy to speak with you and to be on the same show at the same time with you. Likewise. An, and an honor. I love you. Oh, thank you. Aww. <laughs> Yeah. That's so sweet. Thank you. Haven't you guys been on one together much. a year ago, though? Uh, not, not directly. I think I was in the chat while she was on, and yeah, we've, okay. we've yeah we've been in the same space. But it's just nice to tell you I love you. Yeah, Beth's Aww. a legend. <laughs> you guys uh, are great. So we'll, we'll have to connect more. Yeah, you guys should. You have uh, you're both brilliant. Uh, before we go, I'll announce a couple shows coming out. Um, we're not going to do Interverse on Sunday because that's Christmas night, but I will do it on Monday. So sometime, maybe like in the afternoon or day. So just stay tuned. The Intergram tel Interverse Telegram channel is the way to stay up to date with everything that I'm going to put out. But we have a great conversation coming with, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on his name. We're just... <laughs> I'm sorry. I talked to a lot of people. Okay. So it was uh, Austin, of course. Yes. Austin Walters. I apologize for totally blanking on his name, but he is the biomagnetism guy. You may have heard him on Crow a couple of times, but we had a really riveting conversation about biomagnetism, biofield tuning, all of the above. Really great conversation. Really great extra portal to uh, radicalization and exit from victim consciousness. You guys will love it. So that'll be on Monday. Uh, we'll do, uh, I'm going to be on Michelle's healing home on Tuesday. So watch out for that YouTube channel and that'll all be linked in telegram whenever it's happening. And uh, next week's vibrant will also be great. I'm going to keep that a surprise though. And with that, we will sign off for the evening. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. And uh, may you guys have a blessed solstice and holiday season. I'm feeling the blessings. Oh, got a shout out to Brayden who gave a very, very, very generous gift over on Rockfin with a super chat. Love you a lot, brother. I'm super glad you're in the community. And all right. <laughs> Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Lots of love. <laughs>